Uh, we have a special uh, program today in memory of Toby Willa, the last show. Um, those of us, I, I, I'm assuming most of you knew her. Is there anyone here that did not know Toby? You did not. Anybody else? Okay. Okay, so I'm just going to say something very fast and then I'm going to introduce our speaker uh, who also has some nice things to say. Um, those of us who were on the Toby Willig Lecture Series Committee had the privilege of working with Toby for many, many years. Um, she was one of a kind, very unique person. She lived her life every single day to the fullest. Uh, she was very hard to reach because she was always somewhere uh, at a lecture, a concert, uh, whatever, but she was very devoted to Muna for 50 years. She used to be president of Amuna America, and she used to lobby Congress on behalf of uh, Amuna uh, and Israel in general. Um, and after she made Aliyah, she lived here for at least 35 years. And during that time, she gave, you know, she belonged to other organizations also, but Amuna was the top of her list. And she created this committee to provide important programming to the English-speaking community in Jerusalem. Not just for Amuna, but for everyone. So she would be so happy to see all of you. Um, the one thing I do want to say, uh, most of you would know that she used to write letters to the Jerusalem Post almost every day. Um, we found out after she passed away that she had written at least 5,000 letters. Yeah, every day. Every day, and me and Rebecca used to <laughs> type a lot of them for her. And she was amazing because she would dictate the letter and get it right the first time. And anyway, uh, Rini uh, gave all the letters she kept copies of to uh, Toby's daughter, Ruth Konigsberg. It's the only way through, sorry. Unfortunately, Ruth isn't feeling well today. Um, she was supposed to come, but she's not feeling well enough. Um, uh, so, uh, she was just a, a unique human being. And I was kept thinking to myself, with all the stuff that's been going on in the news here for the last year or two, including everything now, is I would be dying to read Toby's letters. Um, and she always wanted um, her voice to be heard. She did that in many ways. And one of them was, you know, through the letters that she wrote. And the other was um, at lectures and things like that, you'd think she fell asleep, and then she'd get the first question, and she, you could tell that she hadn't missed a beat. Um, so I found out from Ruthie that in Toby's uh, living will, I think, she asked that people please keep talking about her. And so that's one of our goals, is that we keep talking about her and perpetuate her memory. And uh, now I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Sarah uh, Kodesh, Kadosh, sorry, uh, who will tell you a few things about Toby herself. Uh, uh, Dr. Kadosh uh, was a research fellow at um, Yad Vashem for a long time. And she also worked uh, at the Joint Distribution Committee and she taught at Toro College. Uh, okay, everybody please turn off any cell phones. Um, and she, she did research on a, a book for a book called We Think of You as an Angel. And she will tell you about it. It's the story of Shaul Weingart. Um, and I think you're going to find it a fascinating story. So I'm going to turn it over now to Sarah. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Um, First of all, I want to thank Amuna very much. And thank closer to the Thank Amuna. Thank Amuna. Now you hear me better. And to thank Marlene, thank Amuna Women. It's a really a privilege for me to come to an event in honor of Toby Willig. Toby Willig knew my parents well. I knew her when I was growing up in Queens. My sister was. My late sister was best friends with her daughter Ruth, and I'm also friends with her daughter Ruth. And now my husband is sitting Shiva, and Ruth, Ruthie and her husband came to visit Be Shiva called two days ago. Unfortunately, she couldn't come today. So it is really a privilege for me to be here. And I remember many times in Israel, listening on the news, 
when they had some kind of conference and Netanyahu was there, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and he would say, oh yes, and Toby said this, and oh yes, Toby, what do you think? And that was, that was her position in Israel, I'm sure many of you remember. Now I'd like to talk about my book a little bit, um, but I will have to sit, I'm showing you um, this, and I'll have to sit in order to move the slides. So let me know if you hear me. Just open your mouth. Open your mouth. Yes, okay. yes, yes, I will sit down and do it sitting down. Okay, you hear me now? Okay, now. Um, in mid-August 1939, a young Polish rabbi named Shaul Weinberg arrived in Switzerland to visit his fiancée. Shaul Weinberg. Two weeks after he reached Switzerland, World War II broke out. He couldn't go back to Poland because of the war. He couldn't go to England where he, he had a job waiting for him as a rabbi in London. And with the help of his future father-in-law, he got permission to remain in Switzerland as a refugee. A refugee who was not allowed to work, couldn't earn a living, had no family there, had no money. But instead of saying, OK, I'll stay in Switzerland and marry the girl and build a family, he decided that he had to devote his life to saving his relatives, his parents, his siblings, his family, extended family, and many of his friends who still remained in occupied Poland <coughs> under German rule. How was he to do that? A young man alone, 24 years old, with no, no funds, no connections in Switzerland. Jean Weinbord was born in the town of Bielsko-Biala, which is here, it's at the corner of Poland, near Czechoslovakia. At that time, it was already Slovakia. This was an area that had been under the rule of the Austro-Hungarian Empire until World War I. And everybody there spoke German. Shao and his family also spoke German, and he was educated in German in the school, in the local schools. He attended local schools, a, a, a school in, in Bielsko, and he received private tutoring in Jewish studies, and also in secular studies, so that he could qualify for the matura, that was the examination that would allow him to attend university. Shaul came from a family of Gerer Hasidim, and he was even related to the Gerer Rebbe. But this is a picture of his family in 1939 that don't look like the image you might have of Gerer Hasidim. His grandfather, Abel Rappaport, was a leading industrialist who owned factories in Biosko, which was an industrial city. And his father was also a businessman. How do you see the family? Shaul was the oldest at that time. Maybe he was in early 20s. His father, his mother, his brother Leo, a little bit younger, and his youngest sister, Rose. Modern looking family. Now, when Shaul was about 18 years old, the Chochmat Lublin Yeshiva was opened in Lublin by Rabbi Meir Shapiro, who later created the Daf Yomi. And Rabbi Shapiro invited Shaul to become a student. Shaul's father and grandfather were thrilled to have him go there, but his mother didn't want that. His mother wanted him to have a broad education, not to be a typical Polish rabbinical student. So she turned to Rabbi Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg, one of the leading Talmudic scholars of the day, and asked him to take Shaul back to Berlin, where he was head of the Hildesheimer Rabbinical Seminary. 
This was a seminary where students studied for Smicha, but they were also required to register at the University of Berlin for a secular degree. So, over the objections of his father, Shaul traveled with Rabbi Weinberg to Berlin. He was the youngest student at the time, but he was brilliant, and gradually he worked his way up until he became the star pupil of Rabbi Weinberg. While Shaul was at the Hildesheimer Seminary, Rabbi Yerachmiel Bochko, who headed the yeshiva of Montreux in Switzerland, started looking for a shidda for his daughter Miriam. The yeshiva of Montreux, by the way, during World War II, was virtually the only yeshiva that remained open in Europe, because the Germans closed all the other ones. And Switzerland was neutral. Germans didn't come there. So Rabbi Boschko came to Rabbi um, Weinberg in Berlin, and he said to him, can you recommend a shidda for my daughter Miriam? Miriam had been forced to drop out of school because her mother was ill, but she was self-taught, and she used to hire boys from his father's, her, her father's yeshiva to teach her Jewish studies. But she re also ran the family business. They had a family business. They produced blouses and jackets for women, and she designed and marketed these in, in various countries of Europe. It was a very accomplished woman. So Rabbi Weinberg suggested that maybe Shaul Weinberg would like to meet his daughter, uh, 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 Miriam Bochko. Shaul agreed um, to travel to Montreux in Switzerland to teach for a couple of weeks at the yeshiva in order to get to know Miriam Bochko. And after a few weeks, the couple became engaged. This was October 1938, right after Sukkot, Shao had to go back to Berlin to resume his teaching at the yeshiva, which was in Berlin. But before he could do that, the Germans decided to expel all Polish citizens from Germany and send them back to Poland. 1938, October. And as Shao was a Polish citizen, he too was expelled. I might add that Shao attended the University of Berlin during the early years of the Hitler regime. He, um, he came in the in early 1930s and he was there until 1938. But in those years, although he was Jewish, he was allowed to continue his studies because he was a Polish citizen, not a German citizen. And he was the last person to sit for the oral exams in the University of Berlin, the last Jewish person. So Shaul, in October 1938, had to return to Poland. And what he'd wanted to do more than anything else was to go to Switzerland to visit his fiancée. And this was already in the middle of the war. How could he do that? The Swiss did not want to give him a visa to enter, nor to his parents. Switzerland did not want Jews in Switzerland. So they made all kinds of obstacles to Jews who wanted to come in. So, with the help of his father-in-law, Shaul got an offer to, to be a rabbi in London. And he, he got a ticket to Switzerland with a, um, intending to go on to London. And because his final destination was London, the Swiss gave him a transit visa for one day to stop to visit his fiancée. So he arrived in August to visit his fiancée, and as I said then, World War II broke out. He couldn't continue to London or go back to Poland. And he decided to try rescue. Now, what did he do? His first rescue activity was to send food. His family ran away from Bielsko, and they ended up in Warsaw, and later in the Warsaw Ghetto. And they told him to send food packages. Now, this is a list um, it's like an advertisement at the supermarket. These are the packages you can buy here, and they could be sent to any of these countries, including Poland. So Shaul, maybe mainly his fiance, would order packages of things like cocoa and coffee, 
sometimes knots and mazes, things that were easy to carry, <coughs> that could easily be sent abroad, and the people who received them in Poland would sell them for more basic foodstuffs so they could have what to eat. <coughs> so Shaul and his, his uh, fiance sent packages to Warsaw and to many other ghettos in Poland. And even people began writing to him and saying, could you send us a package? One of the people who wrote to him was Rabbi Menachem Zimba, whom some of you might have heard of, who was a leading rabbi in the Warsaw Ghetto. And he sent these packages, people would write to him, thank you for the packages that are keeping us alive. These are the letters he got from the ghettos. Before I continue, I'll say a word about communication with Switzerland. Switzerland was neutral, but because it was neutral, people could write letters and send packages from Switzerland to occupied Europe under German rule, and they could send letters back, but there was one condition. The letters had to be written in German or French or language that the censors would understand, and they were not allowed to specifically describe the conditions in Poland. They couldn't say, oh, we're all starving, and it's terrible, or the police are terrible, nothing like that. Every, everything had to be do, done in hints and illusions. So, for example, Shaul Weingart got a letter from a relative in Poland. Um, Please send us packages. If I do not receive help, I will have to join Aunt Miriam. Aunt Miriam had passed away 20 years before. So this was the way they tried to indicate how desperate they were. By the way, they even sent packages into Auschwitz. And a woman who survived Auschwitz wrote to him after the war how they kept her alive. Now, in 1942, or a little before, the Germans began to deport Jews from Poland to Treblinka, the extermination camp. And now, Shaul Wander looked for other ways to save people. One of the ways was to send a foreign passport to a person in Poland. How did that work? And this was not only Shaul, but people in other countries did this as well. You would go to a consul, mainly of a South American country, who was a consul somewhere, and purchase a passport from him. And he would fill in the name of the person who was supposed to get the passport. Then you would mail the passport to the person who was supposed to receive it. So Shaul, the first passport he sent was to his brother, Leo. Leo had run away from Bielsko to reach the part of Poland that was occupied by the Russians. And he succeeded in reaching it. He went to Lvov. Um, and then the Germans threatened to enter. The Germans occupied Lvov. So Shaul had to think of ways to save his brother. And he thought of sending him a passport. He acquired a pa Paraguayan passport, sent it to his brother, and when the Germans came, his, they didn't touch his brother. They left him alone. And his brother eventually went back to Warsaw. And from this, Shaul and others learned that if you had a foreign passport, you would be saved from Tri Treblinka. So he began to order passports for his immediate family, for friends, for relatives, for others who requested the passport. This particular one was sent to Rabbi Hudeleg Orlean, was one of the leading rabbis in the Warsaw Ghetto. Now, as people learned that you could be saved by a passport, they began to beg for passports. They called them packages or gifts. Send me a gift, send me a package. And they, be, they uh, received letters from all over. And I have one letter here which I put on the screen which was from the town of Benden. And uh, people had it, um, <coughs> had it right in code, so I hope you can read it. Better put this thing. I don't know if you can see, it says in the second line, Bo Mayim Ad Nefesh. Those who know Hebrew, 
the, the water is up to here, we're drowning, we need help immediately. So they didn't have to say, send me a passport, they said, just send help. And the person who wrote this included photographs of his wife and children so they could be inserted into the passport. Okay, in, um, in the beginning of 1943, um, the people who had these kind of passports um, and were not sent to extermination camps, they were held by the Germans for exchange. There were many Germans living in allied countries and many of them were interned, like Germans in the South America, Germans in the United States, they were interned in camps and kept. And Germany wanted to bring them back to Germany, so they offered to exchange them with citizens of allied countries who were in Europe. So the Germans agreed that people who had these passports could be exchanged for these Germans, they kept alive and exchanged for the Germans. Um, so many of them were rounded up and put in prisons in the meantime before uh, waiting to be sent. Many of the uh, people in Poland, the Jews who had passports, were placed in prisons for their protection and till waiting until they could be exchanged. And when the deportations came, so nobody took them. They were in a prison or they were in a camp. They were saved. At the beginning of 1943, the Germans took many of those people who were in prisons or internment camps and sent them out of Poland westward to France to the town of Vittel. Vittel is here. Yeah. If you can see it, I'll show it on the map. Here's Vittel in eastern France in occupied France, where they would await their exchange. Now, they were sent to an internment camp. Maybe you can imagine what a camp looks like. You would think it has barracks, it has watchtowers. So this is what Vittel looked like. Um. Vittel was a resort. And you may have heard of Vittel Water. Vittel had mineral springs. People would come there for vacation and bathe in the mineral springs. It had tennis courts. It had golf courses. It was a resort, and it had hotels. Now, some of the hotels were in a park, and some of them were across the street in the town of Vittel. This was the largest um, hotel in Vittel. Um, it had some, some of the rooms had private bathrooms. It even had central heating. Try to imagine that some 200 Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto coming from an atmosphere of starvation and police and deportations are brought to this hotel. They come in and the German sitting at the reception desk says, would you like a room with a balcony? People were absolutely in shock. I couldn't believe that this was happening. And this group that came from, um, the first group that came to Vittel, some 200 more people who were Jews with passport, with the Paraguayan passports, the leader of that group was Rabbi Shaftai HaKohen Rappaport, who was the rabbi of the town of Pinchuk. Rabbi Rappaport went to the Germans and asked if he could organize a synagogue in Vittel. No problem, take a room. So he took a room in Vittel. He made a synagogue. They had services, and women also came. They had, during the week, they had shirim. The men sat and learned, and a year later, they even met a seal of the whole shas. So this was Vittel. Several months later, after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, another group came from Poland, and they were housed in other hotels, and the synagogue moved to one of the other hotels, but continued in hotels. There was no problem with kosher food. Um, the Germans let the people go into the basement where the kitchens were, 
and they could use the kitchen. They could kasher a burner and work on it, and they, they even made them bake things for themselves with the um, materials that they found, if they could find things that lack flour and water and sugar that don't need a hefsher. And people who had South American passports or British passports got food packages from their home countries. And these the packages included canned goods, vegetables, fruits, fish. They also included meat. So the religious Jews exchanged the meat with, uh, with, with internees for other things. Anyway, that was, this was the time that we were going to tell. Something else I would like to add, in the group that came from Warsaw, there, were, there was a young woman and her fiancé, the daughter of Rabbi Rappaport, who came with her fiancé, a poet. So he decided that they had to make a wedding for them, but they had to have a mikvah so she could go to the mikvah. How to make a mikvah in this camp? Well, there was a young woman in the camp named Ruth Adler. Ruth Adler's parents um, were from Germany, and after Hitler came to power, they moved to Paris, and she moved with them. In Paris, she became religious. She kept Shabbat. And she joined Youth Aliyah, which was active in Paris. They sent her to Palestine, to a Youth Aliyah village. And she was there for a few years, and after uh, um, after a few years, in 1939, she decided to visit her parents in Paris. And unfortunately, she went back to Paris, and the Germans invaded. Now, because she had a Palestinian passport, because she had lived in Israel, she was not considered, she was not sent to a camp. She was rounded up and sent to the tell with the people who had foreign passports waiting to be exchanged. And when she reached the town, Rabbi Rappaport asked her to help with the mikvah because she knew French really well. Now in Vitell, every day, French workmen came into the buildings to do maintenance work. Most of them were members of the underground, the resistance in France. So, So, um, Ruth Adler asked the workmen if they would be willing to help build a mikvah, and they said yes. So they built a mikvah in the ground, in Vitell, without the knowledge of the Germans. And after it was finished, they used the mikvah, and afterwards they made a wedding for this couple with the permission of the commandant of the camp. And then they used the mikvah before Yom Kippur, and then went to the mikvah. So everything was going along fine, and they all thought that they were going to remain in this camp until the end of the war, and suddenly something happened. The Germans decided that these passports that were purchased from the consuls were really fake. They weren't genuine passports. And if they weren't genuine passports, the people who held them were just ordinary Jews, and there was no reason not to send them to Treblinka or Auschwitz. So when the Germans told the people that, they became very frightened. And they wrote letters to Schal Weingord, save us, what are we going to do? Schal Weingord contacted representatives of the British government, and he contacted representatives of the, Fr the French government, um, and the Red Cross, he wrote letters, and these governments said, okay, we recognize the passports as genuine, but the Germans, they didn't repent. They said, no, we don't accept that, and that's it. They, we don't consider them foreign citizens. We consider them just ordinary Jews. So now they were in panic. And then in, May, in April 1944, the first group of people was taken out of the hotels of Vittel and sent to Auschwitz. And in May 1944, a second group was sent. Before they left Vittel, Ruth Adler, who as I said was this religious girl who helped out with the mikvah and everything, she wasn't going to be deported anywhere because she had a Palestinian passport. So the people asked her 
to bring a Sefer Torah with her to Israel. When they went to the town, they took with them a Sefer Torah, she, and they had it with them, and she agreed to take it. So they brought a Sefer Torah to her room, and then she had to figure out how would she get it out of the camp and smuggle it to Eretz Yisrael. Well, there was a man in the camp, around the whole camp of Yitel, who was barbed wire. And one of the guards who patrolled the barbed wire was an elderly German whom Ruth Adler knew from her childhood in Germany. She went to him and asked him what to do. He said, no problem. Wrap it up, bring it to me, and I'll help you. So she wrapped up the Sefer Torah. She walked out to the barbed wire. She passed it to him. He took it, and she went back to her room. On the day of the deportation, when she, they told, no, excuse me. Um, on the day of the deportation, the people were deported, but she was not deported. She was sent to Israel. And when she left the camp, the Germans suspected her of something, and they stripped her and searched her, and when they didn't find anything, they beat her up, but they didn't find anything. She went outside to get on the bus that was going to take her for exchange. She got on the bus, and one of the people on the bus turned around and said to her, here is a package for you from the German guard. And it was a Sefer Torah. Now she traveled with that package by train all through Europe until she reached Haifa. And then she gave it to somebody in Paul El Hudat Yisrael in Israel. So, <coughs> Shaul Weinberg, meanwhile, couldn't save his immediate family. They were sent to Auschwitz. But he, meanwhile, became active in Switzerland with the refugees there. There were 20,000 Jewish refugees in Switzerland. Even though Switzerland didn't want them, some of them were allowed in for humanitarian reasons, and some of them succeeded in crossing the border illegally. Shaul Weinberg became a chaplain in the refugee camps. He was in charge of providing religious articles, kosher food, food for Pesach, and um, he took care of a number of camps in Switzerland. This is a letter from a child <coughs> who thanked him for Sidur. I don't know, I'll read it. it it's a child who wrote Hebrew with so many um, grammatical errors and spelling errors it's hard to understand. I will just read it to you and translate it for you. Okay. This was written in 1944. Shalom Adon Weingort. Everybody, everybody, hello, Mr. Weingort. Toda Meruba Vishivil Hatafila. That was the Sidur. He couldn't say Sidur. Thank you for the Sidur that you sent me. I promise every day to use the Sidur to pray. Shalom Avracha Hananya Ganda. That was the name of the boy. Hmm? You can go look at it if you want. So the war ended, Shaul Weinberg was active in the Swiss Jewish community. He continued to teach at the yeshiva as father-in-law in Montreux. He married Miriam Boschko, they had three children. And he was active in the Jewish community. And then in September 1946, there was a terrible accident. Shaul was on his way to teach in his yeshiva. He was killed in a freak train accident. And the whole Jewish community of Switzerland <coughs> mourned him. So, so in Zurich, they had the, the largest funeral there. The soul was in Zurich. Um, so he passed away in 1946. And after the, the state of Israel was established, his wife had him reburied here in Israel in the Sanhedrin Cemetery here in Jerusalem. <laughs> Miriam Boschko continued to live in Switzerland with her three children, and eventually all of them moved to Israel. And today, um, one of her grandsons is head of the Yeshivat Hester in Gush Etzion. Another um, cousin is head of the Yeshivat Hester in Kohat Yaakov. 
Now, Charles Weinberg lived only seven years in Switzerland. He came in 1939, and he was killed in 1946. But in those seven years, he accomplished more than most of us will ever accomplish in a lifetime. Thank you for your attention. I'll take questions. You want? No, I'm just happy to take I confess that I Googled this beforehand because I was fascinated with your story. And it was wonderful, incredible, very important for us for the history. And when it came to the part that he's killed by in an accident in 46, I said to myself, the Gorishaloyla, he went through the war, he went through everything, but it was meant to be that he was, it, it, it's am amazing to me that after all this, he was killed like that. It's just, I, I couldn't get over it. <coughs> he was only 31 years old. Exactly, yeah. 31? 31. You know, just see what's for sure. Just, I looked it on the Google, I read the whole thing, and it was very good. The microphone? What? The microphone? Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? I'll be happy to answer them. Okay. She wants to make Yes. How did he fund his activities? I mean, he must have paid for these fake passports. Right. So some at the beginning, his father-in-law helped him out. But afterwards, he received money from the Bar Hatzala, which was set up in the United States to help uh, yeshiva boys or yeshivas. And uh, he used that money to help uh, pay for the passports. Mm -hmm. And some of the people who ordered, who wanted passports, could pay for them by themselves. But you're right, it was a problem to raise money during the war for this. Did he get any funding from the joint? No, he wasn't connected at that time to the joint. The joint sent funding to the Warsaw Ghetto, but not to Charles Weinberg. How did you happen to come upon him, of all people, to uh, study and, and learn about? Okay, I... Um, I was a research fellow at Yad Vashem, and, and the topic I took at the time was Jewish refugees in Switzerland. And after I gave a speech about that, um, a man who was present came up to me, introduced himself. Um, he was a wonderful man named David Kranzler. Maybe some of you have heard of him. Yeah. Shalom. He was one of the pioneers in the history of the Haredi community in, uh, the, during the war. And he knew all about Switzerland. And he told me that the family of Charles Weinbord was looking for somebody to write a book about him. Then I went to Yad Vashem. And they also told me. So Yad Vashem encouraged me to do this book. Thank you. Yes. How many survivors were there from Vittel? Okay. Um, so the official number is very low, I think uh, maybe less than 20, but it, it's not an exact number. I think there were 30 or 40 survivors, most of them who hid in the camp and did not go on the deportation. However, I'll tell you about some of them. When the day of the deportation came, four people went and hid in the <coughs> oven in the basement of the hotel. This was an oven that the Hasidic, the Gera Hasidim, had used to bake matzah for Pesach. And so they knew about it. They crawled into the oven, four people, and waited and hoped that the Germans who were searching in the hotel wouldn't find them, and they weren't found. And they remained in the hotel. There was another man named Natan Ek. He later became active in Yad Vashem. And he was on the train, on the deportation train, and the wife said to him, I think that the Weinborgs had a relative in Paris. Tell them to give you the address. So he got the address, he was on the train, and when they got to Paris, the train stopped at a station, and it turned out that there was a window open in the bathroom of the train. So he jumped out of that window, and one or two others also. 
And he wandered around Paris until he found the relative of Charles Weinbord who lived in Paris. And he stayed with that person until then. <coughs> he also saved his daughter that way. The workmen who used to come into Vittel were members of the resistance. They offered <coughs> to hide 12 children with peasants. But the Hasidim who were in Vittel were afraid to give their children to the uh, there were non-Jewish peasants. Only Natan Ek, he decided to do something. He took his daughter, he had an 11-year-old daughter, and he put her in the trust of one of the internees in Vittel who was Jewish, a French woman who was Jewish, and she kept the little girl in her room until after the deportation. So there was another woman who hid in the bathroom, in one of the rooms, and various people were saved. Maybe 30 people were saved. But there were hundreds of Jews in the camp. And some of them had uh, Paraguayan passports, but there were also other Jews from other places who were in the camp. <coughs> they weren't treated as Jews, though. Only the Polish Jews were treated as Jews. The others survived. Mm -hmm. and any other questions? Yeah. Did his uh, family all perish? Yeah. 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 And his parents and his brothers and his sister. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and his uncles, his rabbi, Rappaport, all his uncles, he had a big family in the camp, they all perished in Auschwitz, except his ones who somehow ran away. Yes. Yes. <coughs> very, very much. Um, very enlightening and I think inspiring story that you can hear about some of the people that did so much. Um, and that's why I think the book is called We Think of You as an Angel, right? Uh, I can tell you why it's called that. Okay. <laughs> because um, when they got to Patel, um, Charles Weingort continued to send them items from Poland. Although they had food in Patel, they didn't have any religious articles many things. Uh, toiletries they didn't have there. He used to send them even clothes. They would send a list of clothes and he would send them shoes and socks and blouses according to the sizes of there were children in Vittel. He would buy these things and send them to Vittel. So Rabbi Rappaport, who was at the time in Vittel, wrote to him, we think of you as an angel because you take care of all our needs. Was Rabbi Rappaport related to a family in Manchester? Does Rappaport family belong in England? Pardon? Was Rabbi Rappaport related to a Rabbi Rappaport who was a Roth in Manchester in England? I wonder if it's the same family. I don't know. It's possible it's a big family. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I want to thank Sarah again very much. We have a little gift for you. Thank you for taking it. We still have some pastry and coffee and feel free to get something else to eat. Uh, I do want to just remind everybody uh, that